How are you? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Yoko Sen, as uh, Peggy wonderfully introduced. Thank you so much. I am an ambient electronic musician. So I was born and raised in Japan, and I was classically trained with piano since I was three, but now I work with different technologies and collaborate with different artists to create music and performance and experience to bring people of different backgrounds together. And I love what I do. But several years ago, I was sick. I had some mysterious health complications. And I had to spend quite some time in hospitals. As a musician, I'm sensitive to sound. So I was so disturbed by the noise, alarms, or the chaos. Lying in a bed, I used to wonder. Some people say hearing is the last sense to go when we die. So what is the last sound I get to hear at the end of my life? Is it like this? Unnecessary noise is the cruelest absence of care. Florence Nightingale said more than 100 years ago, since then, medicine has progressed so much. Technology is progressing every day, but not the quality of our sound environment. Now, are there any musicians in this room? Yes, there are a couple of them, wonderful. So this is what happens when a musician goes to a hospital today. You hear a cardiac monitor in note of C, and there's a bed fall alarm, and it's high-pitched F sharp, and they're beeping together, and it's a diminished fifth, or a tritone. So this particular dissonance was called, in medieval time, devil's chord, or devil's music. People thought it was so disturbing that it was banned by churches to play that dissonance, and that could be what we are hearing in hospitals today. Why does it have to be this way, right? Now, there was a moment in my life for a few months that I was convinced that I wouldn't be able to get back to what I thought to be normal life anymore. Then I got lucky and I got better, rather unexpectedly. So this part of my life right now feels like a lucky bonus with which I kind of get to do anything. So I started this social experiment, Sense Sound, with a vision to transform the sound environment in hospitals, first being supported by social entrepreneurship incubator, Halusion Incubator in Washington, DC, and soon collaborating with patients, clinicians, different hospitals, and medical device companies to explore how sound impacts our experience, emotions, and environment. During the time I was getting recovery, recovered, my husband Avery was working on a dissertation, PhD, on the subject of transformative innovation. And when you have a spouse who works on PhD for seven, eight years, and your dinner table conversation every night is about his dissertation, you kind of end up getting a PhD on being a spouse of somebody who's actually getting a PhD. <laughs> So I feel like, in a way, that this social experiment is his theoretical background of transformative innovation, meeting my experience as a patient and curiosity as an artist. In his study, he kind of studied this idea of mode one and mode two uh, uh, organizing way of uh, innovation. Usually he's the one who talks about this, so I'm going to try my best. Mode one is called scientific uh, innovation. So most important thing here is the objective knowledge of 
disciplined experts, but in more to post-scientific approach, just as important is the subjective experience of everyday people. It's also in mode one approach, innovators tend to be natural scientists and engineers, but in mode two post-scientific approach, innovators can be social scientists and artists working in studio or in the community, and the work tend to be more synthetic. The other way to explain this, in mode one scientific approach, oftentimes people start with a technology or a solution, and what ecosystem will it fit into? But in mode two approach, we typically start with the ecosystem and say what solution will fit into it. My husband jokingly says that mode one is a penis approach, and <laughs> mode two is more like a vaginal approach. My, this session is categorized under uh, uh, sex, Drugs and rock and roll, so I needed to make the reference just, just to be uh, sure. And there's nothing wrong with penis, but you know, we need more of a vaginal approach in this way. Anyway. So, you know, oftentimes in the mode one approach, there's an island of a scientific discovery, and you know, we spend more resource on increasing these scientific studies, which is, you know, important. And we could also create more bridge to people living everyday experience, patients, clinicians who are actually affected by this issue by creating more bridge. So my approach tends to be more of a creating bridge. Working with places like Johns Hopkins Sibley Innovation Hub, our process always involves patients clinicians, hospital leaders, medical device engineers, so that we could co-create this idea of improving the hospital environment together. So for today, I like to go over noise as a symptom, care for caregivers, human-centered alarms, the aesthetic realm, and reimagine end of life. Does it sound like a good plan? Wonderful, so let's start with noise as a symptom. Our process always start, starts with asking questions with people. Like, walk me through all the sounds you remember hearing in this hospital. What is the most disturbing sound you remember hearing? Let's, let's ask this room. What is the most disturbing sound you remember hearing in hospitals? Alarms, the pumps on your leg, yes. Jackhammers, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Buzzing from the lights, yes, yes. How about you? I heard uh, a caregiver who shared that the constant rhythm of the cardiac monitor, to, 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 it's like a ticking time bomb, reminding her every second that she was caring for her father, that her father's time here is finite. What about the voice of other people suffering in pain? The, the cold blue, the sign that somebody's having a cardiac arrest, or the call button, phones, pages, somebody's cell phone. A nurse once shared with me that it's the sound of alarms that she hears in her dreams every night after she gets home after a long, long shift. A pediatric physician once shared with me that it's a sound of silence after devastating news has been shared. When we listen to people talking about sound, their stories are always more than just about sound. They seem to reveal what it means to be a human during the most vulnerable and difficult times of our lives. Because life happens in nuances that our language 
cannot often capture because sound is something so subconscious. When, we pe when people start to talk about sound, the stories tend to be more emotional and personal. Now, patients often say that alarms are disturbing, but also that sound of people, like behavior-based noise, like talking, doors getting slammed can be very disturbing as well. And lots of those noise come from visitors and people who work in hospitals as well. So you see these posters everywhere, which is not quite effective, right? So we spent more time with uh, people who work in hospitals, clinicians, technicians. So noise causes stress. It's, it's easy to think that way. But we also observed that stress is causing noisy behaviors. Like when I'm stressed out, I am less mindful, I talk loud, I slam the doors, I don't really care. So things get noisier, which causes more stress, which causes more noise, and things get more stressful. It's like a chaotic cycle. As we work very hard to reduce noise in order to reduce stress, could we also help reduce the stress of people who work in hospitals in order to reduce the behavior-based noise. So the first thing we prototyped in Johns Hopkins Sibley Memorial Hospital is what we call a staff tranquility room. It's an immersive relaxation space for anyone who works in the hospital to take a moment of respite from all the sensory overload. The room is filled with soothing light, music, aromatherapy, herbal tea, and feels like a spa. And we invited the community of people who walk and asked how they like it, and they really liked it. And I asked, do you want something like this? Like, they really want it. So we worked with the architecture firm Gensler, who donated the pro bono work so that we could include the voices of the community to create the design of this space together. So we implemented this relaxation space January last year. And after a year and a half, uh, we continue to monitor the usage. And the room continues to be used very actively by all the staff. And I think the case study of uh, this project will be featured by National Academy of Medicine that's doing an initiative on clinician well-being. So we have learned that to promote a culture of quietness, first we have to care for people who care for others. Now we addressed those behavior-based noise. Next is this alarm, right? So let's just, if you go to typical hospitals in the US, you hear patient monitors like this, and then you have a IV pump, when the liquid is empty, it just beeps. Bed fall alarm when you, know, you move the bed and there's this phone. So they are just some of those you know, sounds that you might be familiar. Let's do a little quiz here. What do you think the average number of alarms we hear per patient per day, according to a study in Johns Hopkins? Any guess? 50? 300? 1,500, yes. All good guess, so it's actually 350 per patient per day. So among those you know, 350 alarms, what do you think the percentage of alarms that are false positive or clinically insignificant? 80%. 85%? 90. 95%. 95%. Did you do your homework or you have a bunch of experts here? <laughs> it's 85 to 99%. Yes, you are, you are lots of experts here. So the last quiz, what do you think the average number of auditory alarms an average human can differentiate at once? Two, two three, four. four, yes, all great guess it's three to four. So, and this is the number of beeps we hear in you know, average hospital unit. 16, but in some other unit, we counted 23, 
25. And, you know, on top of that, there are little things like, you know, you have your card ID that you have to scan to enter some room and that makes beep, like a little sound. Like over the course of the day, if your room is next to the room that has this card key scan, you hear the bit, bit like every you know minute or so. The elevator has the noise. There are lots of little machine sounds, and as a musician, this is how I hear, you know, with different pitches. But as you could see, lots of those alarms are clustered around similar pitch pitch zones. And the decibel level can go as loud as 86 decibel. That's as loud as the sound of chainsaw. But when we talk to patients, it's not just the loudness of alarms. It's the fear of not knowing what those beeps mean. When we talk to the caregivers in children's hospital, like if you are a parent of the child connected to those devices, when you know things beep so sharply, the first thing you think is, is, is my child going to die? We spoke to a couple of parents that, you know, whose ch children used to be in NICU and they used to hear those beeps. And after decades, of that experience, they hear similar beeps and they just go, you know, traumatized when they hear beeps that's similar to those sounds that they remember hearing in NICU. When I was a patient, I remember that, you know, my sense of identity had become the, the name of my condition, my diagnosis. I didn't get to choose what I wear, you know, or, or the sensory environment. Was, was informing me that my sense of aut autonomy, my control, it's all taken away. And this sensory environment reinforces the idea that I'm now a patient, I'm not a human who happens to be in a hospital today. When we talk to clinicians, when we talk about this idea of alarm fatigue, the conversations are almost always focused on patient safety, patient outcome, which is, of course, very important. But the conversations are almost never about the negative impact of noise on clinicians or on their well-being. So we are creating and developing an interactive curriculum to resensitize clinicians, not on the noise, but the impact of things like noise on their own well-being so that they can start to pay more attention. We soon realized that working with clinicians is not enough because oftentimes those noise is a, a hospital-wide issue. Some of those noise is based on procedures. And even the solution like tranquility room could be used as a way of what we call surface level appeasing because the larger issue could be you know, institutional, like people are constantly getting understaffed or not having enough time to take a break. So we realize we also have to engage with hospital leaders and collaborating with my amazing friend, Sonia Rose, who leads this amazing project engaging with hospital executives from different hospital systems. We blindfold them, take them on a tour to listen to things, to use awareness around sound as a way to develop what we call organizational mindfulness. But then soon we realized that working with hospital executives is not enough because they can't really change the sound of alarms. If we really want to transform the sound, we have to reach out to device companies because they are the ones who can change the sound. So we started to talk to device companies and actually work with some of them to help redesign the tone of those devices. Many of them you know, spent lots of resource and energy on visual design of the device, interactive design, but just never thought about sound. We talked to one engineer of one device company whose wife got hospitalized, and he had to hear the sound of device that he created. And that was the first time that, wow, we have to do something. 
This was last month in May. I got to visit Stuttgart in Germany to engage with um, this company that makes a lot of patient monitors. Many of the hospitals, you, you walk in random intensive care unit here in the US, and the sound of this company's patient monitor is probably the first thing you hear. And I spent last couple of years really hearing this product's sound day to day, and I got to spend some time with them sharing stories of patients and clinicians. And the entire team of people who make those monitors came and it was really incredible. Um, they said, we do UX design, like user experience, but for us, our users were never really humans. Today, our users became humans through the stories. And unexpectedly, those engineers and designers, they became humans to me as well. Somehow, I just never imagined that there are people who are making those devices and they are just like you know me and you. They are frustrated with their bosses who don't get it and they came to this company doing this thing, trying to make things better for patients. So we are no longer strangers. We spent the whole day, what can we do together? And we are so excited. Now we as uh, drinking buddies, what we can do together. <laughs> but, you know, things are not as simple. I, I do believe that, you know, I don't really work with those large companies and industries. It's more that we work with rebels within those organizations who want to do something. And change can be very slow. So the next step, and this is really I'm sharing as things are happening, our next vision is to work with patients and clinicians who have to hear those sounds every day and co-create an inventory of alarm sounds that can be adapted by any of those device companies and make it open sourced and open any of the processes and researches to the public because I think sound environment is a public good, just like safety or hygiene. It's one area that people in different backgrounds need to come together. It's not enough to change the sound of one device from one device company. Everybody needs to be talking with each other, and it's so hard to make it happen. So we hope to lead this movement involving people, and I'm so excited to continue this conversation if any of you have any ideas. So that is the alarm. Now, if teasing unnecessary suffering out of the system is our first design cue, then tending to dignity by way of the senses, the aesthetic realm, is the design cue number two. My favorite palliative care physician, BJ Mira, shared this. So reducing the unnecessary noise of alarm is a first step, but I think there are possibilities of sound and music to promote the positive experience for people. So i like to show a little bit of an experiment. Could we switch the visual from the house to wonderful? By the way, thank you so much for the, the, all the team here. Uh, you know, I have a complicated tech requirement. They worked so hard to make everything happen. I just wanted to acknowledge wonderful, wonderful team. Thank you. Thank you. So, what if, what if, what if I just kind of move my hand and it triggers some sound? using some augmented reality, like some kind of a magic. What if anyone can play the piano? Even if you have never learned how to play an instrument. What 
if anyone has a bridge to create their own sound experience even during the most difficult times. And what if these these alarms that we just had, so annoying. What if we can just start by, I don't know, tuning those alarms, same sound, but just, I don't know, F major or something? Simple solution, right? Like, what if we just use some common sense to start reimagining the soundscape of a hospital? What if our sensory experience is reconsidered as what makes us human? And what if the last sound we get to hear is the first sound we remember hearing. Thank you. So, I like to invite a volunteer on stage because it's not really magic. I don't have any sensors or anything. Anybody can do this. Anyone? Anyone? Please? Oh, everybody's shy. Would you like to come, please? Yes. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. So it's very simple. Uh, it's the camera that's uh, detecting your motion, and you see yourself, uh -huh, just like that. So you can move your arms, yes, just like that. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, what if we could have something like this in children's hospital or while people are having infusion or dialysis treatments? What if patients can create music together, but even not with, without looking at this? So for today, I demonstrated for the clarity to have some visual display, but we are working on ways that we just use the camera. So, you know, people don't really need to look at screens in any way. We could convert the entire hospital lobby or a random space into an instrument. So if you are interested in any collaboration idea, I'm... Uh, ready to co-create, so that's some of the ideas we are working on. Could you switch uh, back to the house computer, please? Thank you, thank you very much. Wonderful group, wow. <laughs> so that was the aesthetic realm, and we have collaborated with a different integrative medicine center and in conversation with uh, different hospitals to, to really explore the positive impact of sound. I'm a little conservative when it comes to playing music in space. Music can be very personal. So one piece of music that's nice for one group of people might not be so nice. Uh, somebody like me uh, tends to prefer silence but somebody like my husband always needs to have some sound around. So it's really difficult uh, to think of one thing that fits everybody. And I think it's really important to be very mindful to think about individual need of people in the hospital. Now, changes are not simple. When, when change is not easy, um, you know, having a low expectation about things often becomes one's survival strategy. Like, oh, it's, it's just a hospital noise. We don't go to hospitals to rest. People could say things like that. When things are difficult 
I often think about this lesson from the human-centered design, which is to learn from extreme scenarios. And I think healthcare itself is one extreme scenario of the society. And within the healthcare, one extreme scenario is the end of life. So I often return to my first question, which is, what is the last sound you wish to hear at the end of your life? We worked with different communities to collect the stories of people sharing the last sound they like to hear at the end of their lives. And the project started to kind of gain the life of its own. It traveled to Iceland, India, Japan, Brazil, and I got to engage with people from different cultures sharing the last sound. And soon I started to notice that there is almost this a common thread of answers across different cultures. But one thing I had in common so far is that in every culture, people say, in, in my culture, it's taboo to talk about death and dying. And I say, it's not just your culture, it's probably most of you know, cultures. And ironically, it's one thing that could potentially unite the humanity, that the fear of dying. And miracles started to happen in these processes. Um, two, two months ago, I was in Northwell Health in New York, and I collected the answers from uh, those CEOs and COOs of the hospital systems before the visit. And I would usually edit their voices before the visit and play their, the, the sounds of their voices as a community. Um, one of the, the executives, I think she was a chief, chief medical officer, so she recorded her answer, and after she recorded her answer and sent the file to me, um, somebody she knew came to ICU and he was actively dying. Because she had this experience of recording her last sound, immediately she said, what is the last sound do you think he, he wanted to hear? And the family member said, Billy Joel. He, he really likes Billy Joel. <laughs> so they ended up playing the, the Billy Joel, hoping that it would be the last sound for him. I had somebody who came to me after one of my concerts, and she said, I, I just saw the video of your talk two years ago somewhere randomly about this last sound. Since then, my, my father passed away. But during the time I was caring for my father, I remembered the idea of my you know, last sound, and I believed he could hear me, so I kept holding his hand and I kept talking to him, and that made a difference. One of my favorite stories is uh, Morgan. She's a palliative care nurse at a hospital in New York. She said oftentimes, She's in a difficult and intimate moment of liberating someone from the ventilator with the expectation that this person's life thereafter will be very short. Since she came across with this question, their team started to play a piece of meaningful music or sound that, that they believe to be personal. And this has impacted not just patients and their caregivers, but their entire unit tremendously. The beauty of our sensory experience is what makes us human. So, in this last day, one of the last sessions of amazing Aspen Ideas Health. I like to invite you to close your eyes, if you like, for a moment. And together in this space, reflect as a community. That, you know, and not as a heavy, scary, depressing question. 
but a playful, light-hearted, open invitation that if this could be anything you like, what is the last sound you wish to hear at the end of your life? The last song I wish to hear in my life would be a gentle breeze through the trees. Of being on a mountainside and hearing the wind go past. Then I would like to hear the sound of the wind. The ocean. The ocean waves hitting the beach. Just the sound of waves gently reaching the shore. The sound of running water surrounding me as I stand in a salmon stream fishing, which is something that is probably the most peaceful place on earth for me. The gentle sound of a creek in a mountain forest and the calming voices of my family. You know, every illness is a love story. The love is surrounding illness because it takes something away from someone who's hurting. The last sound I would wish to hear is the voice of a loved one around me, to know that they were there for me in those last moments. It's the voice of my loved ones. Loved ones having connected human moment, you know, even if it's not with me. <laughs> the sound of my friends and family talking about all the good experiences we had in life. My family, my children, my grandchildren, all around me, laughing, telling stories, listening to music. The last sound that I'd like to hear is my sister playing the violin. is my son's voice and laughter. It's the voice of my kids saying, Daddy, see you on the other side, bye bye. It's my children. It's just so easy to say that. My mother's voice. <laughs> lullaby and a bedtime song. Going off to sleep and just relaxed and like safe. As I fall asleep, yeah. That you know you're feeling felt by another person as you leave. Thunderstorm. Just starting to take action. If it's painful death, I would like to hear a cat purr. Is of my cat purring in my ear. The last sound I'd like to hear at the end of my life is some sort of validation that my life was meaningful. You were important. What you did mattered to lots of people. You left a significantly, statistically significant mark on the human condition. The last sound I wish to hear uh, at the end of life is uh, toilet flushing. The last sound I wish to hear is my husband's fart. The last sound that I wish to hear before I die is laughter. A symphony of laughter of my two daughters and my wife. I would love to hear laughter because I think that joy is what I want to carry with me out into what comes next. It's a baby laughing because the universe has a sense of humor.
sound that I would like to hear is something that I've never heard of before, that I've never imagined before. some time for questions, comments, anything you like to share. And I think there is a, a, somebody with a microphone. So, Hi. Uh, you have such a wonderful vision of the uh, way sounds in hospitals could be for patients. This is really nice. Um, my question is, when you met the engineers from Philips, my guess is their first design change wouldn't be to your ideal vision. I mean, because engineers take small steps at a time. So do you, would, are there some things, if there were three Philips monitors in a patient's room, that you would like to see them change, you know, in, in the small baby steps that would make the exp patient experience better? Thank you for your question. So this is the topic that, you know, we could do another one-hour talk because it's, it's fairly complex, as you could imagine, because it's the area of patient safety. So if we do something wrong, people could die. And there is actually a regulation that defines the type of tones that we are allowed to use. And I have three, four wonderful colleagues and friends who are actually in the committee who just updated some of those regulations. The challenge is that I had this mentor um, who uh, told me that you know, in order to innovate, you have to start with three I, uh, illegal, immoral, and impractical. <laughs> so if we start with the confinement of a regulation, the design process will be very fear-based. So absolutely, we have to take incremental steps. But at the same time, it's really hard to think about paradigm-shifting ideas within a confinement. Uh, that's why I'm really excited about the idea of involving patients and clinicians not necessarily experts, because there are already experts who are working on safety side of ideas, which is very important. But you know, they may not be necessarily familiar with the lived experience of you know, what it feels to be in ICU every day. So I'm interested in working with um, uh, pediatric patients in children's hospital. What if we could co-create some of the sounds with kids? Like, what would they pick? Maybe voice of mommy, sound of you know dog barking. Now, those sounds are definitely not implementable, right? But in the process, the amount of insights we can learn by engaging with people can inform some of those incremental steps that people are taking. So that's the role I'm personally considering to take, which is to be a bridge for people who have to hear those sounds. And that could be creative, that could be fun, but definitely the step needs to be incremental. Thank you so much. That was just, just an incredibly immersive experience. I'm curious, is there any research that's been done uh, that uh, demonstrates the positive impact of uh, sound as it relates to someone's healing, ability to heal? Absolutely. There are lots of scientific studies. Um, in fact, there were a couple of speakers in this uh, conference as well, the Dr. Kogan, who played the piano, and he's a psychiatrist. I think there was a panel of uh, musicians talking about the healing power. Um, there are uh, scientists who specifically kind of study music and medicine in that framework. Uh, there has been demonstrated effect of music on patients with Alzheimer, dementia, Parkinson's disease. Um, I personally like uh, there is a music therapist in Japan who said, music doesn't heal people. P 
people heal themselves. But music and sound can be in support of people healing themselves. And I like that kind of a humble stance, and that's what I tend to believe. But there are lots of studies. There is a journal called Music and Medicine, and uh, uh, there are a few other journals, but I think you can find some studies there as well. Are there other arenas in which changing the composition of noise would bring down uh, crowd dynamic stress, or are, are you looking at things outside of the hospital or medical setting? Thank you for the question. I think that, uh, so Brian Eno is a composer uh, of uh, ambient electronic music. He came up with this uh, album, uh, Music for the Airport, and it's just a beautiful, you know, piece that somehow works with all the little dings and noise that's happening at the airport. I think that that was very interesting beginning. The area of sound design tended to focus on like transportation, um, restaurants, some retail, but less about the well-being of people as a public goods. Uh, some of the car companies spend millions of dollars to you know, calibrate the sound of the door being closed because that's associated with the brand. I personally um, think it's great that people are doing things uh, in different areas. Uh, if, if we could solve something in hospital, which I think is probably the most challenging area, or if not solve it, but learn something from the field, I think there are lots of insights and implications we can take from that to different places. I'm interested in schools, subway, metro, space for everyday people, for everyday experience. So uh, definitely there are applications as well. Uh, anything else? Yes. Uh, I wanted to mention that I, I met a couple of people during the conference who told me I have to start this thing, Twitter. I'm a social media illiterate, so I started Twitter two days ago. So <laughs> and people often ask, you know, how do you get in touch with people? And I don't know. So if you are interested, uh, it's Yoko K. It's my middle name, Sen. Uh, it's my Twitter. I have probably 25 followers right now. <laughs> But uh, if you have any ideas uh, about any of the things that you experience together, I'd love to stay in touch. Uh, so that's probably the, the best way. And I hope uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to find me afterwards. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.